So the Talmud tells us that there are two kinds of arguments. There is an argument that is productive, which the Talmud describes as an argument, l'shem shamayim, for heaven's sake, or a good productive argument. And there are arguments that are shalol l'shem shamayim, that are not for the sake of heaven, an argument that is destructive, that doesn't lead to any positive outcome. And then the Talmud gives two examples. The example of a positive argument will be the arguments between Hillel and Shammai, who were two rabbis and had two different kind of schools of thought in the times of the Talmud. And their example of a destructive argument is that of Korach and his followers who rebelled against Moses in the desert. Now, I don't know how many of you remember where we mentioned Korach before, last month. Do you remember? Not part of them, right. And, and she made a point of saying they were not part of them because they represented so much negative. Okay, so I gave you an example in source two just to see an example of how they argued over different Jewish legal issues. And the example I gave you, we tried to pick a timely one from Hanukkah. What is, what is Shammai's opinion on lighting the menorah on Hanukkah? Yeah. Right, you start on day one, you light eight, and then you decrease in each, each day until the last day of Hanukkah, you'd be lighting one. And Hillel says? The opposite. And who do we follow? Hillel. Hillel, right. And in most cases, in most cases, we follow Hillel. Okay, so if you looked at sources three, four, and five, there were some commentators on the Mishnah, the original piece from the Talmud, that are talking about what makes this conflict productive versus destructive? Any thoughts here from the sources or your own experiences? Yes? Um, a productive argument is trying to get to the truth, and a non productive argument is for victory, for power, for self gain, for the sake of our, uh, to actually, for the sake of actually arguing, enjoying the contention. Okay, excellent. I mean, you just nailed that on your head, right? Whether you're getting into this argument and your end goal is what is what you said, truth, or whether you just, you know, it's a power struggle. Someone wants more power, which was the case of Korach, where he might have presented his argument as one of truth, but, but in truth, what was Korach after? Power. He didn't like the fact that his cousin Moshe, Moses had the power. He wanted power. Okay. Truth versus, you mentioned uh, wanting to be right. That kind of ego piece of, no, I'm right, and not being able to let go of the, that personal wanting to be vindicated and be right, or wanting to be victorious. Okay, but a debate, how can an argument be productive? If you're both seeking the truth, then what happens in the argument itself? Think about it. If you are going back and forth with someone and your ultimate goal is truth, what are you doing to, with each other? Yes? You're discussing it and seeing all sides of the... Okay. And when I push you, what am I forcing you to do? Push you back. And, what do, and therefore, what do I have to do? Think I have to... Th the right. I have to sure. think about the other side. I, and if I still think that my position is the true position, then I have to clarify. I have to refine. I have to take my point of view and integrate the factors that you have presented and, and ask myself, does that still work? And if, I, if it does, then put that back so that in the course of the, of the back and forth of the argument of the dispute, we are both sharpening our positions. We are both taking into account factors we didn't previously consider. And we are getting closer to the truth. OK, which is what I want you to see. Now, what could also potentially happen? Did anyone get to source six? Um, I, don't, I don't get it. OK, so, so this one, OK, <laughs> like, right. The, the legal, I wanted you to focus on the, the different sides of the argument. So it starts, it starts that Beit Hillel had an opinion, 
and it has to do with the laws of leveret marriage, which also relates back to the daughters of Slavgod, right? She, her husband had died. She doesn't. She didn't have children. Okay. So if you go on, on um, page three, that second line, but Beit Hillel says, we have heard so, and expresses their opinion. And Beit Shammai said to them, but no, it's similar to a different case. You didn't take into account this other situation, which is more similar and would then have a different outcome. And what does Beit Hillel say in the last line? Beit Hillel went back and taught according to Beit Shammai. Which means, what did, what did Hillel acknowledge? Beit Shammai was right. Beit Shammai was right, right? Beit, and, and that's a, a real sign of an argument being a productive argument that's really about the truth and not being about power and not being about who's wrong and who's right. If you're actually willing to say, oh, I didn't think about that, you're, you're actually right. And they changed the way they taught, and they taught it according to Beit Shammai's opinion because they were able to acknowledge that Beit Shammai was right. So one, one of the guiding questions that we wanted to ask here is about motivation and about people's feelings, and how does that play into arguments? How does a person's personal, in your own experience, have you been able to identify an occasion where you could tell that someone's personal feelings was kind of playing, impacting the argument, the back and forth? Yes? Yeah, absolutely. Like if somebody has something else going on in their world, something that's not such a big deal might turn into a bigger deal because they're upset about something else. Okay. So somebody might be coming to the table already stressed out from a different point in their life. Maybe they're having some argument in their personal life and they're fatigued or they're, right, they're, they're just feeling that need to have a victory. Yes? Um, someone could come to an argument having experienced something similar before. Good, right. And it's not related, but because of that experience, it impacts having no relation, just how they felt before can impact the outcome. Good. Good. And that's actually something that if you're having a back and forth, is so valuable because if you can understand what personal, what past experience is influencing that person's approach, you can so better understand their point of view. And then either be able to see the similarities, you'll be able to see, you know what, this, here's how this situation is actually different from the one that we are facing now. Or maybe you acknowledge, but maybe you acknowledge that Maybe it, it is similar, and that point of view has, val is, has validity. But either way, you understand when you can understand where the other person is coming from, it, it's a game changer. It's a game changer because you can understand how not only understand their point of view, but you can understand how to better explain your point of view because you understand where they're coming from. And a lot of times, if you can figure out what the other per where the other person is at, then you know the best argument the to convince them. You know, if you're trying to convince someone, if you're trying to convince a manager to approve a project, okay, and you know where your manager is at in terms of what's his or her goals for the year, what are his or her concerns, and you can straight up pitch your project in a way that that fits right in to his or her goals and alleviates the concerns that you know he or she will have, well, you're, you, you're already ahead of the game. You know, so kind of knowing that personal piece and what motivations might be coming into it is extremely helpful. And that's, I want to talk about this with Hillel and Shammai. You know, what's amazing is you know, that they truly listened to each other, and that's another real important piece in conflicts and in difficult conversations, if you are able to truly listen to that person and try to understand their point of view, as opposed to spending the entire time from the minute they open their mouth thinking about, no, this is how I want to counter it, and thinking about what you're trying to say back, and so you're not actually hearing that person. Um, and really considering the other person's opinion and being open to the fact that there might be some validity there. 
even, there might be some validity there, and you might be wrong, or there, you might still be right, but there's still validity to their point of view, and their point of view will still be helpful. Another beautiful thing about Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai was that it wasn't personal. There was no personal attack. When they had a dispute, when they had a back and forth, they had an argument, it was really about the issue. It was about a point in Jewish law. But there was no animosity there. There was no ad hominem attack. There was, it was about the issues. And in fact, and this is mentioned in Source 7, Hillel and Shammai were in-laws. Their children married each other. So even though if you just read the Talmud, you, were think, you would think we were dealing with a Capulet Montague situation, okay? There was no Romeo and Juliet here. Their kids got married. They were friends. They were friends. They spent time together. And it reminds me, I don't know how many of you um, recognize the name Ari Fold. He was, he was um, murdered. He was in Israel, at, and actually an American Israeli living in Israel, who was an advocate, and he was murdered in a terrorist attack. And there were all these tributes about him. But there was one that, to me, was the most beautiful, and that was from Uri Zaki, who was a, a Meretz representative. It was his arch enemy, okay? He was his arch enemy. They used to go on, on um, a television show, it was like the kind of the point-counterpoint, and, and fight like dogs about the issues every week, right? You would look at them, you would think they were arch enemies. And the most beautiful tribute came from him because he said that every week after their show, after arguing, they would get a drink together and talk about life and talk about their families because they wanted to remind each other that they weren't just ideologues. They were people. They were people with lives and families and hopes and dreams. And, and they didn't want to get to the point that happens so often in in disputes that they get so heated that we tend to almost dehumanize the other side. And they, and they really made a strong point of not doing that. And, and he could acknowledge, Uri, that even though Ari Fold was so, I mean, as far politically as could be, that he still wanted what was best for the state. They didn't agree on what was best for the state, but he, could, but he could step back and acknowledge, even though I disagree with him on every fiber of my being, I can still acknowledge that he's looking for, he has the country's best interest in mind. And that's something that really is beautiful, and that's something to strive for, and that's something that is missing a lot in politics today, and certainly on social media, where civil discourse is, is breaking down to an extreme degree. And, and I mean, every day you just see personal attacks as opposed to a disagreement on an issue. Yeah? Um, I'm wondering how power plays into this situation. So this was between two peers. Okay. As a mid-level manager, <clears throat> there's people above us and there's, there's people below us. And like, oftentimes the power dynamics between that sort of plays into whether or not that person will ever see your argument as valid. Right. So, yeah, do you want to answer? Well, I was just going to like liken it to if you, um, you, know, you watch a football game and they're going at it the whole entire time, and then every single time the game ends, the players go around and hug each other. And it's sort of human nature to, if you can get beyond that power and that ego, to want to come back and have a drink with the person and, right. and talk about normal things. And it's okay to disagree and have a healthy conversation about it. Right. No, 100%. Yeah. I was just going to say the power struggle. I mean, that's a really good point. I think that if you're lucky enough, you're in a structure where there's respect. Because I think that that's the key. Like, hopefully, if you're the, the, the person on the higher level, let's say, then you're going to respect that even though they're not your peers and they're underneath you, that you were once at that point, that they still have a valid argument or a valid thing to say, and then I would hope that the opposite would be true. I think that the issue, like even if you're going to a, a manager that's above you, hopefully they respect you, they respect what you have to offer, they respect your strengths, 
the problem becomes when you're in a structure where it's about power and ego. Right. And I don't think, a lot of times, I just don't think there's really a way to win, unfortunately. Like amongst peers or whatever, I think the biggest issue that I see is that if I'm having an argument with someone and it's all about ego, um, which usually comes from a place of insecurity, honestly. Right, yeah, 100%. Um, then the argument is never about the facts and it's never about what's best. It's always about what they think is right. It's usually based on emotion or insecurity. And so a lot of times, um, you know, there's not really going to be a really great outcome, I think, you know, in that kind of power. You know, I think it brings up things that we talked about in the past two sessions. So in the first session, we talked about being an ethical leader. And, and one of the benchmarks of being an ethical leader is how you relate to power. It is power a way to get things done and or to use this week's terminology to get to the truth? Or is power a way to be self-aggrandizing and all about ego? And if you are the ethical leader, then then you don't capitalize on your power then you would be the person then you would be the Moses who hears the daughters of Slavgod's petition and doesn't say well if I didn't think of it it's a bad idea but is rather open to you know what these women thought of something that I did not know okay um, if you have the person who is the power the, the ego driven power person then it goes back to what we talked about last week last month and tailoring your message so if if you know that your manager is all about power and ego and you want to advocate for a person or a project then you have to explain that and why this is this will look so good for you if that's what needs to be done that needs to be done you need to explain you present it in a way that that it's this is in you the manager's best interest and i, I mean i assume there's yes Right. Hearing it from others as well, you know, not to like you know overturn the ship, but just to you know get a to right. And and I'm not suggesting, by the way, that you frame it in a way that is for the manager's best interest when it isn't. I'm not I'm not suggesting to be disingenuous, but I am suggesting that there are ways that you could frame it in a way if it's if it really you really believe it's a good idea, it is good for the <laughs> organization, it's good for the manager. Then yes, if you can rally troops, if you can build more support, and ultimately frame it in a way that that the this manager does not feel threatened and can feel that oh yes I see how this would be in my best interest if that's really what that person's thinking of then then you go with that kind of tailoring and you know you meant there there are so many texts like that of of you can see um in the text like off the top of my head there's a whole conversation with King David and Abigail who he all he who he was so impressed with how she was able to convince him of something that he proposed to her at the end of the story um, but but that's a great example of the text where you see two people who um, there is a dispute he is in a major power position he is the king and she is able to just get her point of view across in 100% framed in how it is beneficial for him as opposed to how it would be beneficial for her and 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 that is why she was successful and I think it's a great tactic I mean it's a great approach to learn from okay if you look at source 9 this this is um, no sorry source 8 source 8 is amazing okay because the Talmud tells us Okay, for three years, Hillel and Shammai argued, one saying, Jewish, the law is like us, one the law is like us. And then a voice comes out from heaven and says, these and these are the words of the living God. Elu ve'elu divrei Elohim chayim. That both of the, you're both right. You're both right. But halacha is the actual law is like Hillel. Okay, that, that's the voice. So, the, so there's an important message here. The idea that in a dispute, it could be that both sides are actually right in the argument. They're both points of view are valid. They're both valid. Now, ultimately, you're going to have to choose one or the other because you can't do both. I mean, unless you can find a compromise, but you know what I mean? You can't do both. But you can, there's a lot of um, validation in, in acknowledging another side and saying like, you know what? We are both right. There is truth here. And even if we end up going with approach B, it doesn't mean that approach A was bad or wrong. There could have been truth there as well. 
And that's something that's very important to keep in mind and to acknowledge. On top of that, I, I want to add that the Talmud says that the reason that on, on a spiritual level, the reason that that the law generally went according to Hillel was because the students of Hillel not only taught their own ideas when they taught, but they also taught Shammai's perspective, and they taught Shammai's perspective first. That when they were teaching, they taught the other side. And that's also such a valuable message. I'm not trying to squelch the other side or like undermine it or ridicule it. No, they taught it as valid. Um, in Source 10, there is an interesting point that if you look on, on, in the um, original statement in the Talmud, it talks about these two arguments, right? It says Hillel and Shammai, okay, is the good argument. And the bad argument is Korach and his followers. What's the problem? What should it have said? Korach and Moses, right? He's fighting against Moses. That's two sides, okay? But... But it's really not. And then there's a point that the Talmud is trying to teach us. And one is that, is that the text didn't want to equate them. Hillel and Shammai were both fighting for truth. But Korach and Moshe were on such different planes where Korach was fighting for power and Moses was fighting for truth that the text didn't want to equate them. And that, in fact, Korach and his followers they were all fighting for more power. They wanted, all wanted a piece of the priesthood, okay? So you have Korach, and he's fighting for the priesthood because he says, no, he's from the same family of Moses, and it should be him who got it. And then you have other people who are firstborns who are fighting for the priesthood because they're firstborns, okay? But look at this coalition. If Korach wins, are his followers actually happy? No, because they, will, they all want the same power, and when you, look at, when you look at a group in a dispute and you see that not only are they fighting against Moses, okay, they're fighting against each other. The fight really was between Korah and his followers. And you can see that it was all about power because you're not even in a coalition that's not going to explode at some point because they all have the same goal. Rabbi Sachs sums this up beautifully. And he says, and you can read this on your own, that in a real dispute, both sides, if, both sides will suffer and neither win. Because if you win, I lose. If I win, I also lose. Because when I'm diminishing you, I'm diminishing myself. And that's what happened with Moses, that even though he won, it hurt him. And a good fight, and this is the concept that we discuss, is when we're talking about what's best for the organization, for the country, for the family. It's about reaching the truth, and that really is the goal of a productive or a good dispute.